two, one. Hello and welcome to the world of digital transformation. My name is Johannes Rana and today we have a great day. Because today I have three great guests with me. Michael Lynch, Soren Kaplan and Rippy Singh. And in a minute or two, I will ask them to introduce themselves. But first, let me introduce a little bit myself. Now, my name is Johannes Frana. I'm a physicist with a background in semiconductor physics and quantum optics and quantum computers. And for about 20 years, I have been working in the sensor industry, the NDE industry. Now, since about 2017, I started to focus my work in the integration of perception or of sensors into the digital transformation to enable machine perception. This was the start of this YouTube channel and to enable the NDT and sensor industry to become part of the world of digital transformation. Now, over the last couple of years, my work became more and more industry agnostic. And actually very recently, Rippy and myself, we started working on a special issue for a scientific journal called Digital Society on digital transformation and its impact on society. So today I will be your host, but for sure I will not just be hosting, I will also participate in all the discussions. That will be too much fun otherwise. So now it's time to give some room to my guests. And yeah, let's start with Michael. Thanks, Johannes. Hi, Michael Lynch here. I'm uh, I'm going to put out front. I'm the dumbest guy in the room um, after Johannes. <laughs> but uh, so my background is kind of wild. If you look on the internet, you can find me with a mullet. I used to be a singer and dancer, and I uh, uh, was on some American television shows, General Hospital, for a couple of years. And then I got into making video games, learned 3D modeling concepts. Uh, then we built a company. Uh, which became the backbone of 3D and PDF, if you've ever worked with 3D and PDF, and uh, and then was acquired by SAP. And then I ran the Internet of Things division for a few years uh, prior to uh, starting uh, my current company, Praxi, with Soren. So nice to see everybody, and thank you guys for joining. And uh, hi, uh, Johannes and everybody. Uh, great to be here. My name is Soren Kaplan. Um, long background in innovation, um, formerly ran the, the strategy and innovation uh, internal consulting group at HP, Hewlett Packard in Silicon Valley. Um, I have done consulting for 30 years. I've probably worked with 30 to 35 of the Fortune 1000 um, in the areas of building cultures of innovation and looking at how to create new product services and business models and kind of um, create systems to do that. Um, I've also taught globally. Um, I've lived in Europe, uh, taught at Copenhagen Business School, Melbourne Business School in Australia. I'm affiliated with USC's Business School Center for Effective Organizations. I'm a co-founder of Praxi, a technology company, and I, I lead a lot of consulting engagements on digital transformation uh, with our clients and, and, uh, and really focus on trying to bring thought leadership to that area as well. And last but not least, Rippy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I think after listening to Soren, I could say that my profile has been very similar to Soren's. I've just been a few years behind him. Uh, but I would say that I've spent 30 years learning uh, what the heck is digital and what the heck is business transformation. And now for the last five years with Johannes, trying to put the digital and transformation together into helping companies look at their future where they would be 10 years from now with all the changes that are going on. Um, my practice is called Inspiring Next. I'm a former professor of aerospace engineering and a former executive uh, with one of the Fortune 500 companies on the R&D side. Uh, thank you, Johannes, for having us all here. So now, before we get started, now, in case you want to ask anything, I guess you have seen this chat box. Just put your comments into the chat and we will try to answer. Now, I can promise that we see all of your comments. I can promise that we will discuss all your comments. But in any case, after we are done with this video, with this webinar, 
if we didn't address your comment, if you didn't address your chat comment, then we will try to answer it afterwards. And one reminder, please click on that little subscription button. Please chat a lot. Please leave some emojis and some likes and some thumbs ups because this is how YouTube rates our channel. And this is what we all need. So let's get started and let's get started with discussing digital or digital transformation and its impact on society. Now, who wants to go first on this topic? Well, I'll, I'll there dive in. Goes. I knew he'd do it. Go for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll dive, I'll dive in. <laughs> um, you know, when when I when I think about digital transformation, um, you know, there's there's a lot of trends that have been happening. I mean, if you look at the, just the history, digital transformation is a very broad concept. You've got the internet. That is digital. Uh, that is about transformation. That created whole new business models. We've had, you know, data and analytics and IoT and, you know, Johannes, you're working sensors and technology, data, and now we have artificial intelligence. All of the world has been transformed already through digital transformation. And I think that the question is, and I, I like this term from the 1950s about cultural lag. That concept is really about how do we uh, how do we adapt and adopt to the technologies that are being introduced socially? And I think we struggle a lot of times with that. You know, the whole world of change management, the whole world of you know, early adopters and trying to figure out how to get people to adopt new technology is all about getting the humans to you know kind of embrace, understand, and hopefully use responsibly the technology. So I think our society right now is in a big debate about ethics, about what AI looks like. And it's all because of this concept of cultural lack. We have to catch up with the tools and technologies that are made available. And I think digital transformation is really, to me, about helping people understand what the power is of what they have and use it in productive and responsible ways. I mean, you know, it's interesting what you're saying, Swan, about people catching up. I was on, uh, uh, I'll plug this company I spoke with yesterday. Uh, they're working on a concept called neuroliteracy, which is basically understanding how your own brain can adapt to these changes. And their basic point of view, and it's, a, I don't know if I agree with that 100%, but it was an interesting point of view, is that, you know, we, have, if you look at the human species, and you, you were talking, Johannes, about the, um, how does it affect society? There's a lot of negatives and positive, but you know, the, hu the human aspect of our ability to adapt to and adopt new technologies and digital transformations at the core of all that is really somewhat being challenged and the human condition is changing. So how it affects society was the essence of your question. I think, you know, huge productivity gains, um, the ability to have stuff all over the world, the ability to track all that stuff. Those are all the sort of things that we've gotten used to. I, I saw the other day that the world economy is basically doubling every 20 years, the, the, the GDP of the world. I mean, that's incredible. But the, uh, how it affects society goes to the human aspects that Soren was talking about. And as we've watched social media, and I know you have a fairly young child. My my children are just going off to college. And I, I see a lot of the damage that this effect has had. Um, so that we have, I think, all the positives. But how it affects society is, I think, unknown. And AI is going to be all those social media issues on steroids. So um, I think we all have to look forward to some more changes. We got to adapt and adopt. If I may add over here, you know, yes, over the last few decades, we have seen technology come and then society has a lag in adopting it because the tech companies are pushing stuff out there for business reasons. I wonder if we recognize this and we recognize that technology has negative consequences as well on the society. Why can't we think of that upfront? Why can't we look at what society really needs and demand that out of the technology companies to develop? You know, yes, I mean, first industrial revolution, second, third, all three, historians are not talking about revolutions, but with fourth, we are recognizing it before it has before it is too late. So we should actually put some meaning into digital transformation and consciously take decisions 
to bring technologies which are in favor of social system, social ecosystem, rather than develop the technology and adopt and then say, oh shit. Right. Yeah. So when you work with all these big companies, I mean, do you see that thought process ever going through uh, corporations when they do their strategic planning for products? Hey, let's develop what society needs rather than what we can sell. I do see that. And if you connect it to innovation and the field of innovation, looking at, you know, the the problems to be solved, that, you know, kind of looking at triple bottom line, looking at, you know, jobs to be done, whatever the tools are. I think the challenge today is that the technology and the digital technology is changing so fast and there's a race to get to market. And we we don't really have the tools to forecast the impact on society and the social impacts of unleashing AI or various tools, we we see what happens and then we try to get data around it. Social media is a great example. There's been debates around, you know, is it is it damaging? Is it not? And it's taken years to really look at the trend lines and depression and suicidal rates, you know, suicide rates and teenagers to make the business case for you know regulation, for example. Um, that I think the challenge is we can think it through to a certain extent, and then we use society as our minimal viable product to, to figure out what we're what we're learning. Yeah, and society that's a big rebels. problem, yeah. and you know we need to figure out how to how to kind of contain that a little bit more. The, the problem, repeat the problem that I see, and is that who is the who is the gatekeeper is a real issue. And I, there were, I saw an interview with Elon Musk where he was talking about a conversation he was having with the, one of the founders of Google. And they were talking about the dangers of AI. And they and they, the founder of Google said, well, what are you, a speciest? Like, like that, like you, you, you know, like it's sort of bigoted to think it's bad if AI takes over and kills us all. <laughs> it was like these bizarre thoughts. Um, but the point being is like, who... Who it like um it, you know uh, the government saying they're gonna try to regulate AI? Who in the government would know enough about AI to be able to even attempt it? Like it's changing so fast. I find you know even if all intentions are good, you look at the central control that you know is going on in Asia and all the building they did, and all of a sudden they, you know buildings are irrelevant because we're doing everything like we're doing right now in Zoom. And so trying to predict with with central control of these things, I think is so difficult. So I kind of feel like the, as Soren said, the beta test is society and, and society, you know, globalization is a perfect example all over the world. People are rebelling against globalization for lots of reasons and maybe some good, some bad, but the point is that society will push back. And as we digitize, I think that the, the Petri dish for better or worse, that is society will have to Push back. Like right now, I think people are really starting to understand the, the dangers of social media to their children, like real dangers. Like we thought, oh, we should be a little careful. But now we're like, oh, my God, like the kids could be suicidal over this stuff. Uh, and so I think society will begin to push back. You see Europe putting more regulations. I think that's the mechanism. I, I don't know any other one that will actually work. I don't know. You know, yep. when I went through my engineering school, we never studied things like psychology, sociology. There was one class on ethics. I get a feeling that in this particular thing, it's more about <laughs> we have to be socially responsible. We all have to be socially responsible and we have to probably grow in our education system in a manner where we push all these technologies. We also push sociology, psychology, social responsibility, ethics. We probably need to educate that. And I, this is... Rippy and I, we have actually written a paper on exactly that topic, and the yeah. the our thoughts were, yeah, we were coming from digitization, we where you needed some physics knowledge, some knowledge about how to convert analog media to digital. We got into digitalization; you needed to know how to program. We are now getting into digital transformation, where we have more an interaction between various disciplines. And once we will reach society or once digital transformation which will reach society, kind of all <laughs> our sciences we have on our planet will have to work together. Well, and that's... If, if, if your point is well taken is that the human <clears throat> are now becoming just as important as the digital you know, difficulties. And so that's, I, I find that at every customer we talk about being very pragmatic, like 
as we go into work on digital transformation industry 4.0, like a lot of customers we have, you know, some are working on machine vision and robotic systems, but most, like most of the employees and people there are, are working in Excel sheets and like the, the basics of just understanding the methodology <laughs> they're trying to implement is where they is where they are today. The, all Excel sheets, all uh, faxes, all emails, all of that stuff for me in some future, if we talk about real digital transformation, all of that has to go away. Yeah, but the and it, but as you're saying, the technology, you know, that graphic behind you, the technology today isn't actually the bigger problem. Although I think we yep. have attacked a portion of it. The biggest problem is how do you bring the people along in a way that because they're highly skeptical of technology, they don't like to change all those kinds of things. But that that's what I find is the human aspect. I mean, Soren, you've got a, he didn't mention this, but he has a PhD in organizational psychology. Do you have any thoughts about you know how to bring people along with digital transformation? Well, you know, it's interesting because even in the 1950s, there was there was this concept of socio-technical systems. So, you know, you have the technology and manufacturing, whatever the technology is, and you need to marry that with the social system that uses it and connects to it, which are just human beings, people. Um, so to culture. And well, you know, the, the culture of every organization is influenced by the broader culture, but is also sort of different. But technology absolutely influences culture. I mean, look look at our global culture now and how fast we're moving, how things are changing, everything's getting disrupted. It creates stress and tension. And there's a lot that happens from a culture standpoint, too. I, I think that the 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 challenge and it goes back to the kind of the the simplification of what technology can do in a meaningful way. So digital transformation. Okay, what are the if if I'm in a team or I'm in an organization, what contribution do I want to make to my customers? That's a value to them and not harmful ideally, but also a value to our communities and the world. If we start from that concept, people I think can rally around real world challenges to solve and, and opportunities to create that are meaningful to them. And then the question is, how do you connect the technology in service of that? That is strategy, it's innovation, it's change management, it's all wrapped up into one. And it's just, it's simple, it's kind of simple concept, but sort of hard to do. Yeah, yeah we, we need the development of some infrastructure to enable all the connections we will need in the future. But that technology development that will be done and that can be done. But the human factors to bring the human along to do something for the humans, because that's essentially why we're doing all of this. We want to have better lives. And I don't want to stand in for hours in a government office to do something my computer could do automatically for me. And that's what we, I think, what should be the future of our computers to support our work and not us being anymore the one copying data from one Excel sheet into an ERP system. But how do you, it, this is interesting to me, the, if you think about a digital transformation roadmap, they're generally thought about, they're a technical roadmap. And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, Rick, the, I, you know, you've done a lot of work in innovation as well. It would seem to me, is there is there a digital transformation change management roadmap that you would recommend based on, you know, the work you've done? Yes, absolutely. So the way we look at it, you know, we say digital is a small part, transformation is a larger part. So in your roadmap, you know, you take your purpose, the social impact or the business impact on the top, and you talk about items for business transformation, items for process digitalization, items for technology digitization. Then you talk about skills, infrastructure, values, organization restructure. So those are all the fundamentals that have to come at the bottom, which feed in to developing the technologies and processes to have an impact. So we look at it, uh, I think you've probably seen one of my posts over here because you seem to be talking exactly what I do. <laughs> well, no, actually, I mean, but it's, uh... So from a from a roadmap, you know, having transformation as the larger portion of the digital transformation, um, in that roadmap, and Soren, you've done a lot of this work as well, I assume. Have, how do you 
create the beginnings of the culture of the transformation? I mean, do you guys normally start with the executive for, you know, to set the executive group to set the, you know, the burning platform of what you're trying to achieve? How do you, how do you, if you think about if you were going to walk into an organization that says we want to digitally transform, what would the roadmap that you would give them to make sure that they're successful, both on the human aspects and the technical aspects? Go ahead, Rippy. Take, oh, take I thought, a I thought he, he actually pointed the question towards you. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I, I will address you. You go first, and then I will say how to All right. start. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it, it's interesting because there's typically been a top-down model around organizational change and culture. Um, and more recently, we've seen a little bit more of a bottom-up model uh, with, with, with organizations kind of um, either, I guess you could say, if you're taking that top-down leadership perspective, revolting, but also leaders can also recognize there's opportunities to tap into networks because every organization is a network. It's not an org, traditional org chart. It is actually a network. And so the question is, how do we allow leadership to take a role in defining the challenges and the problems to solve and the value to create in a meaningful way while tapping into those networks. And so from a digital transformation standpoint, it's it's a both bottom up, top down, and I even hate those words because it suggests hierarchy, but it's a tap into the network, get the ideas, mobilize networks to make change and orchestrate it you know, from a digital perspective, those tool digital tools allow for networks to be built and and collaborate. You know, create collaboration. So you know, that's kind of a high level description of it. But that's, I think, the principles of what we need to be looking at these days. Yeah. So uh, we we the workshops that Johannes and I do usually kick off that transformation activity, and you know, we'll spend three four days just like anybody else, and we look at. The technologies to be brought in, the processes to be brought in, and then we talk about the mindset that must change. Right. So most of our roadmaps are actually twenty percent technology because that's already happening, and thirty percent around processes, and fifty percent of it is how do you build the mindset of digital adoption and change within a company, and then we define things like you know a cadence of what must happen every week, what must happen every month, what must happen on a quarterly basis. And, and build that into your into the daily activity. You know, it's just like uh, like Simon Sinek says, yeah, you can go to the dentist every six months, but you must brush your teeth every day. So we kind of do both. <laughs> so every six month, a workshop, which is like a dentist visit. And then here are the things you must do every day to build that digital mindset. That's how we approach creating a roadmap. Yeah, and we on the one, we normally we build a team. And part of that team will be more from the top down, so more a C-suite or some, some management level. And part of it will be that network of experts, which you will find in every company. You need both. You need the buy-in from the top and you need the buy-in from that network of experts. Otherwise, that digital transformation will not go anywhere. I think a practical example from where we've been working with some very large manufacturing organizations who want innovation. So what's innovation? It's process innovation, product innovation, service innovation, business model innovation. They, they're looking for it all, really. And so we find a, we create a core team, for example, from a cross-functional organizational core team. We have the sponsorship. And we then use that team to create connections across the organization to solicit both the ideas and also find places where there's enough either, either pain and or desire for opportunity to do pilots within the organization. And so, you know, you we're, we're using the team to solicit ideas and to create connections through that through that network in a guided process and all of it's digitized using you know the praxi platform you could use a lot of different technologies but the idea is that there's a structure for kind of the unstructured innovation that needs to happen and so that's it's that kind of give and take between tech technical social unstructured structured and it sounds and like if, from a culture you're you're actually creating a framework to transform to create a digital transformation culture, like where you're iterating constantly and you're 
and so that 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 framework of the specific brushing your teeth, as you said, Rippy, has to be part of the roadmap as much, maybe more than the actual technology. Now, Soren, that's a wonderful explanation. Thank you. You know, I've been following you for 10 years since I started my innovation practice, and I admire the things you have done. It'll be lovely to do some some engagement with you at some point. You actually I'm see looking forward to it, Rippy. I, I'm an engineer and uh, you are a psychologist, so that <laughs> it's so good to be on a platform with you today. Really, thank good. you, Johannes. Good match. Now, perhaps we, we have talked a lot about digital transformation and its impact on society up to the moment. And we already touched on some of the misconceptions about digital transformation. Now, Soren, perhaps question to you. On your experience with all the larger companies, what are the number one misconceptions you have seen? <laughs> well, I, I think we've been talking about it. If you implement the technology, it'll come. The transformation doesn't come from implementing technology. That, that, is, the, that is the number one uh, issue. I think then, then the number two is um, if we create a chief digital transformation officer or chief digital officer role, then we will have it. And, you know, it's like... Um, artificial intelligence, for example, is it someone's job for AI or is it everyone's job to understand it and figure out what it means and what it doesn't? Um, you can have leaders guiding, of course, but um, I think that those were those would be the two biggest um, misconceptions and kind of areas in which I see, you know, kind of organizations faltering uh, with those assumptions. Yeah, I, I, so there's something that in there as well with, I've seen a lot of failures in that the alignment of the incentive structures are not there. They'll create a chief digital officer or a chief innovation group that actually is a matrix organization that sits over people, you know, the rest of the group or sits alongside and there's no real connection between the digital transformation people or the innovation people and the actual business. So the people running the business unit are judged on the same metrics they've always been judged on and coming up with new ideas is nothing that they are judged on and they're not going to do it. It's, you know, I was in that, I was in a kind of role like that running the internet of things at SAP where, you know, you're going to work with salespeople and uh and or business unit leaders and the structure of the transformation has not been built into the incentive structure and and therefore you know people people do what what they're incented to do let me and, let me give you a real practical solution to that so i was this week i was doing a strategy session with one of the top uh solar um uh, manufacturing companies and they are creating a digital platform for their customers so they're they're implementing digital transformation, but they tied that they want 80% of their top tier customers to be adopting this thing within the next year in some way. Well, that drives real behavior change and real focus beyond just here's a tool and we need to just send out the link to our customers. So if you tie metrics that are that are concrete to those strategies that can really help. Yeah, one of the but things, I, Rip, you want to go first? Yeah, but, but Soren, I would I would give a counter argument to that. Sometimes when you put a goal like that, which is such a time bound and a very tangible one, you really don't transform. You do digitalize a lot. You'll probably put more of a technology, technology and some kind of a process, but you may not transform the whole thing. So I look at one of the misconceptions in digital transformation is that people tend to approach it with the lean mindset rather than innovation mindset. They want to have a finite time. They want to have a definable ROI. They want to create it and think of it like a project and not as a strategic transformation, right? Get these guys, throw in a couple of million dollars in, and want them to be transformed in two years. It's a very different mindset. For years, we have been doing Six Sigma and lean and we try to bring the same thought process into transformation, it doesn't work. You really have to think of it from an innovation lens to make it work. 
Rippy, our minds are kind of working too similar by now. It was exactly my point. This, is, uh, yeah, I, I lean thinking lean will only bring you towards digitalization solutions. If you want to get towards a real digital transformation, you have to leave that world of lean and Six Sigma. You have to get innovative. You have to get together with your suppliers, with your customers, with your competition to create a infrastructure which enables your necessary step towards a digital transformation so that afterwards you don't need any more an email or a fax or any of those other solutions which you currently use. How do you guys in that you know, I was at a customer recently and had a conversation with the CFO and he was like, well, what do we get from this digital transformation? And, you know, you have that mindset of core ROI, you know, I was obviously able to answer the question, but if, you know, my experience in innovation is that the value propositions are less hard. Um, they they tend to be softer, cultural, Soren, maybe you and Rippy can talk about those, but how do you communicate that the digital transformation is a you know, multi-year cultural transformation process, but in a way that if you're a CEO or an executive who's got to you know, write the check, that there's hard ROI that they can you know, take to their board and say, this is what we're doing, and not so everybody feels better, but because we're going to get X, Y, and Z out of it. How do you guys position that? Johannes, you want to go first or should I... <laughs> I, I, I would answer what you would answer, so you can go. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we normally look back and uh, bring stories from the history, you know, talk about transformation, for example, mobility transformation from first car to where we are today, aviation, communication, right? And all those people who kept asking the ROI depth questions, how they went out of business. So that's that's one angle that we talk about. Then we ask a question around, Okay, you're asked, you know, what is the cost of not doing it? Do you know that? There is no business today that does not use email. There will not be a business 10 years from now that's not using AI. So give me a reason that you don't want to use AI. This is actually before chat GPT made kind of AI like a breathing thing for everyone. That's the kind of a thing we used to talk about, right? It you're right, it is soft. Right? I'll, uh, I'll take a crack also at this. Um, I have, I've never heard an executive push back on a customer saying that they want a problem solved. So the systematic anecdotal evidence of customer requests and demands for doing business with your organization easier, faster, those kinds of customer driven metrics can create a burning platform or a case that it's very difficult for any technology team to argue with, marketing team to argue with, or executive team to argue with. The customer is driving the agenda. So if you can kind of empower that perspective, that's helpful. Um, so I, you know, I, I'd also focus Wait, just, on- I want to make sure I understand. So you basically talk with the the business and they say, and you you probe on the customer issues, like for instance, this customer, this client I was working with, um, they couldn't fulfill orders fast enough. It was causing them bottlenecks because they didn't have a digitally enabled um, engineering team or et cetera. And so you take it to the customer issue and you draw the problem out there. Yeah. So for example, the solar company I mentioned, the last the, the meeting was this week. We just had it, the strategy session. Well, the previous week, their president visited 40 customers and heard what their problems were. And it just so happened 25 to 30 of them had the same problem around how they were doing business business with them. He came back and he's like, we got to digitize this and we got to fix this because the customers were driving the agenda. So that's that's a very helpful way to kind of cut through the noise and say, yeah, this might take more than a year and it's hard to measure, but we got to do this because if we don't, our customers are going to be upset. Fantastic. So I'm actually aligned with you on that, but I want to give you a very interesting anecdote over here. I was working with a manufacturing client and I said, you know, we should do this, this, this here. And my client said, well, my customers are not asking for it, right? So for about a year, they would not digitalize one particular aspect like providing online quotes, right? Where customer, where their customer 
could get within minutes a co code for the job they want manufactured. And then one fine day, he calls me and he says, Rippy, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, I lost my one of the biggest accounts. I said, why? Well, they went to my competition who digitalized the connectivity with the customer. I said, that's what I was telling you all along, right? So <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Yeah, the, I love it, that, Rippy. You're, you're getting to the issue of listening <laughs> to customers versus leading to customers. And that's an innovation problem. Like that's, that's that is problem. fairly right. And I remember I, I heard the, the head of strategy for Motorola talk one time and somebody in the audience said, why don't you guys create a touchscreen iPhone? Because yeah. the iPhone just come out and he said, well, customers didn't ask for it. Yeah. And so that, that is a real problem. He never you, asked the customers. <laughs> yeah. Well, even if you ask the customers, that's a totally different way of interacting with, you know, technology. Like it, it, customers may not even say they want that, or it might, the first version might be a bad experience and they say, we don't want this. But I think that <laughs> if you quote about that, that if, if you ask people what they want at the turn of the century, they'd say a faster horse, not a car. Yeah. Faster yeah. horses. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, because so, customers so. usually do not know what they want right. to have. You have to get it out of them. You have to get it out of the customers and they know it in their in their back, but they cannot pronounce it. They, they cannot tell you what they really want. And I think that's an essential step to get towards a real digital transformation to not just go to your customers and do a brainstorming with them and ask them, okay, what do you want? No, you have to filter it out of them. You do. You it's it's where design thinking ethnographic research, a lot of the qualitative approaches that come into play around innovation so that you're understanding deeper needs, motivations, pain points, the workarounds customers are doing, and then back into the innovations from there, not just saying, what do you want? So Johannes, uh, during one of our customer workshops about a year and a half ago, two years ago in uh, with a major um, company in um, Germany, he came up with a tool, we call it no more. So you go around the room and people saying, I don't want this anymore. I don't want this anymore. And you make a long list of stuff. Then you combine them and then you say, okay, you know what? There is a solution in digital transformation so that you don't have to do these things anymore. It's very interesting. And then they immediately jump into it because it's like, they can not articulate what they want, but they're able to articulate what they don't want. And you can find a digital solution to what you don't want. <laughs> I love that. That's that's great. Um, I've also seen the the top ten broken broken processes that cause the most pain. Also, you know, in terms of prioritizing digitization too. That's that's great, Rippy. Yeah, but I think there is another big factor which could be driving digital transformation pretty soon. Employees. If you have an a, uh, an employer where you can use your human skills for something productive versus you have an employer where you have to copy data from A to B, yeah, then I would go to the other one. And we have a shortage of good employees anyway. So at some point, in a couple of years, people will choose work environments which are further down a digital transformation road. Yeah, it's, I, I hear this all the time, getting millennials to go work in a gray paint factory with old, you know, technology is not exactly something they want to do. Um, so I think that's important. And, you know, there's a, a trend that we're part of as well is, you know, the citizen developer, the no code environment so that they can take advantage of the platforms and build their own digital transformation solutions, even at a department or line level, et cetera. So I, I agree with you. I think that that's a trend that's already happened. That's part of the bottoms up that Soren was talking about, I think, as well. Now, we already talked a little bit about AI and digital transformation, but how about the combination of both? Where will the combination of both get us? And where will which role will generative AI or GPT or however it's called, what role will that play? Well, I've been doing a lot of work on this with customers and the way we've approached it. You know, like it's the the 
the large language model AI, you know, generative AI stuff is moving so quickly, it's hard to know. I, I, this gets to like, how's anybody going to regulate it because it's moving so fast, so it's hard to know. But, you know, our, our name, Praxy, means the practical application of knowledge. It's, it's, it's just a, that's where the word comes from. So when we look at it, it was how can we practically give people the ability to use this stuff? And I don't know about you, like we all look, I get these newsletters and look at all these amazing tools. A lot of them are content creation tools, visual imagery. I play guitar. So um, one of the, there's a terrific tool that can, um, called Moises, that you can uh, put, put in Jimi Hendrix, let's say, and then you can remove Jimmy's lead and try to play the lead and the guitar. So there's um, lots of amazing tools that are coming up. But if you're a manufacturer, you're a business, how do you practically use them? I mean, Microsoft and Google are putting some of the tools to help the content writing. Soren, we talked about this last night, a lot of content writing. What we've done, here's our current view, is that, you know, obviously it's probably one of the largest productivity changes in our lifetime, right up there with the internet. Um, but how do you use it? Um, the, the large language models are terrific co-pilots. And so what our thinking is, is how do we put additional creativity, functionality, capability at the point of the worker, whatever that worker is, could be executive, could be a line manufacturing person. How do you put that co-pilot capability at the point of that work that's context sensitive to support that work? So we've built AI. There's two things going on, I think. One is that the models themselves look to me like they're going to get commoditized, much like AWS and Azure are at a, at a infrastructure level. You'll pay a penny for every AI request or whatever it is, and they'll all be fairly good, and there'll be open source models that are fairly good. So if we make that assumption, then the question is, how do you build that into the work? So what we've done and where we think we can make it practical is whatever process you're digitizing, we built in AI into the workflow so that if you're doing a gimbal walk in manufacturing, that the AI will analyze all of the comments and what it sees and let you know the types of problems that are and the types of issues they might cause and suggest ways to solve the problem and generate a list of actions that you can assign to your team. Now that's, you may as an individual who knows that plant know some things, but having the entire internet's knowledge around a particular waste issue that you might have seen or a particular leak that you might have seen having all of that knowledge come in and say, hey, you should try these four things is incredibly valuable, we think, and very pragmatic. And what we're doing is we can build that AI support very specifically to any one of those types of problems. So yeah, that's if, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, it's an interesting journey AI was taking. This is when I look into all the AI solutions which were around until a year ago, it was very much into limited technical applications. Yeah, vibration analysis or something like that, yeah. Something like that. So it was really digitalization. It was on the lowest level. It was on an equipment level. But now we are getting with those large language models or those transformer models, we are getting into something where we're getting into the human interaction mode. Yeah. I, I think that let, let me give another example around innovation because we were talking about innovation a few minutes ago. If I want uh, ideas for a new product, I can go to chat GPT or you know, wherever I'll go and I can give a little context and say, give me some ideas and I'll get some ideas. Those ideas are only as good as the inputs and structure that I give to the AI. So uh, if I just say, give me some ideas, I'll get some, you know, AI will decide what formats it in and all of that. What we've done is we know about it, the innovation process. So we know about how to write concepts and business cases. And, and those have typically been in spreadsheets and PowerPoints. What we've done is we've digitized that. So if a team wants ideas, we can create a very structured set of fields essentially where you say here's the business we're in here's the some of the trends we're seeing here's the types of ideas we want we want business model ideas we don't want process improvement ideas we want disruptive ideas we don't want incremental ideas and if you give a team that structure or those options to select all that becomes on the back end the prompts for the AI that we've structured, then you give the teams something that's real breakthrough that they couldn't get on their own. So it's again, taking a, a structure and giving 
a, a team or an organization something that they just couldn't get if they were just trying to create their own, you know, approaches using the the tools that are out there. Yeah, so you know, we uh, we had a fairly early access to GPT almost three years ago, and we started playing with it long ago. And but two years ago, we had created a tool to use GPT to generate ideas. Right? It's available online. It's free access called Iron Story. And once you, you define your problem and you define the context in a reasonable detail, you actually allow GPT to refine it itself from one line to a paragraph. And you added that paragraph, so you framed the box for GPT to work on. And after you've generated like three or four ideas, ask it to give you more, it actually gives you pretty good ideas. Now we run multiple experiments on that. And here is what we discover. One, it will bring ideas because it could find it on the internet because somebody had a similar idea five years ago and has published something, right? So if we were in a room, 10 people, and we generate 100 ideas, GPT was not able to give us anything new. If we only had five or 10, it was able to give me a few new because we just didn't think about it. Somebody else had thought about it and it was available on the cyberspace. So it was able to find it. We also ran an argument that can a large language model trained on candles come up with a light bulb, right? And here is what we found out, that if you train it on that, it could actually come to a light bulb. It could get to a shape of a bulb that generates light, but it had no clue that it's coming because of electricity. It just had the light as an output and a bulb as a shape, but not as an electric light bulb. Right? So the true disruptive innovation would not come in spite of all the combinations as of now. Now, are we limited in the experiments we are able to run? Of course, you know, we, we've done only finite number of experiments. We'll see where this goes, but at some point, hopefully, it'll actually maybe generate a little bit better. So. I think what's, what I see with the large language models, they currently operate all on, yeah, on text, perhaps also on videos or audio. But there, for companies, I think it's an interesting step. And it brings out a lot of for innovation and similar stuff. But I think one additional step could be that once we get to data, which is machine readable, so data from our machines, which is machine readable, and we can also integrate that into our large language models, then we would also have access to all of the machine parameters in human terms. Yeah, there's and that a lot of, could open a completely new world. There's a lot of work going on in that area where, you know, you, and, and I think the, the Amazons and the Microsofts will be very good at this where they'll, in a, you know, they'll interrogate your databases and, and your processes and, and tell you where productivity is lost. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of that. We're looking at it from the standpoint of best practice processes and the types of, for instance, you have a, a bunch of uh, waste happening at a particular line. Um, when that error code comes off of the machine, we can interrogate all of the SOPs that you should be doing and generate a list of things that they could do, but also look at all of the documentation or database information in the company and suggest things that have worked in, you know, at a different time with a similar error code that you might try to do before you call maintenance. So that ability to interrogate the local database of information on that company, I think is going to become more and more valuable. In a private secure way so that that data doesn't get outside the, the firewall, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So, Johannes, you brought up a good point. And last conference, I had a chance to listen to a speaker from a university where they were talking about hybrid modeling, where they're bringing in these scientific models, the physics-based constitutive models, the system behaviors, and combining it with the data, combining it with large language models. I think that could turn out to be the next level where maybe the candle model can go on to predict an electric light bulb because it understands mechanics, physics, electricity, chemistry, who knows, might get there. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question actually out of the chat. Um, will generative AI or super neural network models be the only AI in the context of digitalization or digital transformation? Will supervised, unsupervised learning or classic classification regression eventually disappear completely? Or these models will work in parallel in other layers? I think he's getting into which types of AI technology are going to win out. I, I'm I'm not qualified to have the, the answer to which type of gradient descent algorithm is going to win. But I, I do think what's been interesting about the large language models, they've been able to apply what, as you said, was text-based to generate the predictive and vectors to video and imagery. And, and the large language models are, they're using large language models to do the video and, and audio. So clearly certain techniques are going to win out and like uh, you know, human aspects of training looks to me like it's going away because the machine can create new scenarios and train itself. So I think that this is an area that's going to be very, very interesting and in how rapidly these models can train themselves and make themselves useful. It's also the area where people get really scared because, you know, uh, we don't, I, I think the black box becomes very hard to understand what's happening underneath the hood based on what I've read. Well, and an example of that, I mean, you're going to see, we've been talking about data. Um, you can define data broadly, but, you know, if you look at what MIT is doing with effective computing, and there are now startups where, you know, you can give AI intelligence around reading facial expressions and body language, uh, you, you know, so when, when that is embedded in our Zoom and team meetings and webcams, and then that in intelligence is getting fed in. Um, I'm not sure what that is at the end of the day, but it's it's a level of insight into human beings and behavior that perhaps many of us who just aren't adept at reading body language and facial expressions either won't have or could benefit from potentially by becoming more socially savvy or by helping resolve conflict. Again, it's it's how you apply that. It should either be harmful or helpful depending on the application but the, but all of that is really on the horizon and moving fast and what i liked about the ai society or the ai community in the past was that mostly all research was shared even when people were working for big companies all kind of all of the work results were shared and that's something i do not like about open ai's current approach which keeping their models closed, for sure that they will keep the data closed. Yeah, that's for sure. But also making the models some something which is not accessible, this is not adding to the trust. And I hope that Google's with the BART solutions, they stay more on the open side and it seems like it. But I think that OpenAI is currently walking the wrong direction. Well, but isn't that the answer to that is the Facebook model got released into open source and, and, you know, my reading is that it's iterating. I don't know. There was a famous memo leaked from Google saying we have no moat um, because the open AI, not open AI, the open source AI models that originally came from the Facebook model were being iterated much more quickly because they had much less corporate constraints on their iteration process. And so those models, the prediction was those models will actually outstrip the chat GBTs and the Googles uh, because they're open source. I think the questions, the alternative argument to that is the quality and size of the data. Google has the largest quality or quantity. I don't know about the quality aspects, but to me that those are the two tensions that'll, that'll drive it. But as I said, that's why I think that these things will be commoditized because the closed systems are, you know, by definition, they're going to be unable to keep up with the number of developers and the creativity of the development group around that. So I think the answer, you're honest to your issue is the open source models. Yeah, and we, we saw it in the computer market. Microsoft in the beginning, yeah, everything was closed source and everything was proprietary. And now Microsoft is one of the big supporters of going open. Yeah, although, you know, it's I've been on both sides of this argument. The iPhone is still closed. But how long will it survive that way? It's still, it's, it's, it's a fashion product now. And so that's why it survives. But from a technology standpoint, 
They would yeah. think there are open products which have their benefits. Well, they at I, least opened think, up to their yeah. USB-C port now for charging. <laughs> yeah, they have done that. Give them that. But, you know, they can, they can control the overall experience, which has benefited them in, in the overall experience of it. I, I don't know. I guess you said, I don't know if it'll continue, but they are the largest corporation on the planet. So they've done okay with it. Well, I think that goes back to what's that digital digitization experience, the best experience for that human being. Is yep. open source going to do it? Or Apple has kept it all closed and fully integrated with iOS. Um, and so, you know, it, it there's that there's that tension between a open source, open community and a for-profit company and what they're, they're trying to do as well as what you can control and how you then orchestrate that digital experience at the same time. Those tension points, I think, are not resolved and will you know, continue to live on. There is a pattern that you can see, though, that, that if you guys I push back on this, but I just was thinking that there is a pattern here. If it's use end user facing, the corporate model seems to work. You know, Windows, my um, Apple, if it's an end user thing, if it's a back end thing where it's API driven infrastructure, the open source model dramatically out, outstrips the closed model. So maybe that's where the, you know, if you're building engines, it should be open source. If you're building a car, it, it's probably proprietary. Well, and so why would that be? I mean, maybe a, a hunch is that there's a bit more art into designing that user experience, whereas it, the technical back end is more math versus art and design is where that differentiation is. And I, I think one of the biggest differences is, is the customer. On the one side, you are facing in a business to client environment, you're facing a lot of private persons. And they do not have a say, they just buy what is the best solution on the market. But if you talk about a business to business solution, and if you have just one supplier and it doesn't matter which one it is. I do not see that all of our big OEMs around the planet are going to this one same company to host all of their digital transformation infrastructure, to host all their AI, to host all their knowledge in essence. That is something they want to keep with, uh, for themselves. And if they want to keep it for themselves, that must be different solutions. There cannot be a single player dominating the market. Right. So I and think so in the AI concept, if you have different, just like AWS or Google infrastructure or Azure, you, you do have options there. And at an infrastructure level, I think you're 100% right. Those are going to be open, much more open source friendly environments. Yeah. Okay. Like I... You have a mix of both your proprietary and open source, and eventually, market will determine, you know, people will shake down to a comfortable ecosystem. And you will always need some software companies developing a certain tool for a certain solution, and that will be proprietary. But perhaps it has on both ends, it has an open interface to interact with all the others. I think that could be somehow the future. Wonderful. Okay, we had now a discussion for a wonderful discussion, I must say, for about the last hour. And I think we should be coming to an end. And perhaps we we'll repeat this in some future. I liked it a lot. Now, Christmas is coming up very soon. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of our viewers and to all of us. Any famous last words? Lovely to talk with you guys. And as you said, Rippy, it'd be great if we could do a project together and uh, and keep the cross pollination going. Thanks for thanks for having us. A real pleasure. Absolutely. I I must thank both of you and thank you, Johannes, for facilitating this one. This was wonderful. Great job. So thanks all to all of you out there on the screens for watching, and. I will be inviting more speakers talking about digital transformation and AI on this channel. Uh, usual, as usual, you will find more information in the video description. I will also put some information 
to about Michael and about Soren in the video description and also where you can find Praxi. I hope you like this video. I hope you've subscribed to this channel. I hope I will see you soon. Please give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Thank you and bye.